Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Roland. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, we are from the Shoulder Elbow Orthopedic Group. We are a uh, Shoulder Elbow Specialist. And welcome to the Farrah Parks uh, Hospital, Hospital CME webinar today. Uh, can everybody hear me clearly? I think it should be pretty okay. So I think today we are going to talk about the shoulder. Uh, it's the joint that allows everybody to wash their hair and wear clothes properly. And today's topic is something that is a little bit uh, interesting. It's on something that uh, we do. It's uh, a reverse total shoulder replacement and how you can help your patients. So before uh, I, I hand it over to Ruben, uh, there's a few uh, house rules that I must uh, say first uh, on behalf of the, uh, the organizing committee. Uh, so before we begin, I uh, uh, just want to inform everybody that you'll be muted throughout the session. Uh, you will get to share your thoughts and raise questions to, uh, uh, using the, the Q&A function. So by simply clicking the Q&A button on the bar below, you can type the questions. Uh, uh, Ruben, who is the, the, the speaker today, will try to answer all your live questions uh, during the duration of the, the today's session. But if the questions are not answer, answered, uh, the questions will be collated and will be re replied separately. Uh, as, for, as for CME point, which is the most important thing, no further action is required as long as you have already filled in uh, with your MCR number during the registration. And then the clocking clock out time will be recorded and submitted to SMC for CME points. Uh, it is required for everybody to attend at least 75% of the lecture. And the Zoom login name, email login, uh, and logout time will be captured by Zoom and the report will be submitted to SMC. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Ruben. Ruben is one of my new partners. Uh, we, as I said, we are the shoulder elbow, elbow orthopedic group. Uh, we are shoulder elbow specialist surgeons. He's an excellent uh, shoulder elbow surgeon. And uh, I'll let uh, Ruben talk more about this uh, very interesting topic now. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, thanks, Roland, for that uh, introduction. Uh, thank you also to uh, Peter, Priscilla, and the gang for the introduction. I mean, for the invitation to speak to you all and for helping us get set up today. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I hope you've had your lunch already. And if you haven't, uh, I hope you've got it in front of you so you can just uh, sit back, relax, enjoy lunch, and listen to the soothing sound of my voice. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about reverse sole shoulder replacements and how we can help your patients. Uh, I chose this topic because, you know, everyone knows about total hip replacements and total knee replacements, uh, but there's not much awareness about shoulder replacements and uh, how much they've uh, evolved and progressed uh, in the last 10, 20 years, and uh, how they're having such uh, great results these days and um, uh, how their popularity is soaring. Just to give, put this in perspective, uh, when I was a trainee, I probably only saw three or four cases in like eight years. Uh, but when I was on fellowship, I would be seeing three or four cases a day on one list. And uh, now, you know, within the last four years, I'd say we've probably done about a hundred or more cases at uh, my previous institution. So it's uh, definitely an uh, interesting space to be watching now. Okay. One's technical. Right. So what I hope to cover today, uh, this is the scope. First, we'll have an introduction where we'll be reviewing the anatomy and the function of your shoulder. And then I'll dive proper into the reverse throat shoulder replacements, a bit about the history, how the, this joint is other from, different from other prosthetic joints, and uh, a bit of biomechanics and the complications. Then we go into the clinical indications uh, with the specific case examples uh, for the different scenarios where a reverse shoulder can help your patients. Then we'll discuss the outcomes, where we're at now, and uh, we'll go on to, you know, future direction and where are we headed. And uh, finally, we'll summarize everything and uh, hopefully there's still time for some uh, Q&A at the end of it. Okay, so like Roland mentioned, the shoulder is the most mobile and inherently unstable joint in the body. You know, you can move it forward, flexion, you can move it backwards, you can swing it, inwards and out, that's your adduction and abduction, or you can rotate it internally and externally, or you can do a combination of any of those movements and position your hand anywhere in space. That's called circumduction. It's uh, really quite marvelous, but you know, with all this 
mobility does come that risk of instability as well. Okay, going back to the anatomy, you know, the three main bones that make up the shoulder girdle are your clavicle, your scapula, and the humerus. The joints you have are the acromioclavicular joint, superficially, and the shoulder joint proper uh, formed by the articulation between the humeral head and the glenoid. Outside the shoulder joint, you've got the muscles and the tendons that uh, power it and, and keep it stable. All remember your rotator cuff muscles um, uh, deep inside the shoulder, these help to move it and stabilize it. But there are also many other muscles that attach to the scapula. Some of them are large and uh, superficial, and some of them are small and deep, and they all need to be working uh, in, uh, well in concert for the function to, to be good and in free. Uh, and finally, the last group of structures you have are the soft tissue structures like the ligaments, which hold uh, the two bones together, the labrum, which, have, which happens to deepen the socket, your ball and socket joint, and the capsule, which holds everything together. You know, some we take it for granted, but you know, you need your shoulder for a lot of the daily activities we do every day for both men and women. Uh, you know, shampooing your hair, getting dressed, putting on your bra, toileting, perennial hygiene, hopefully not like this guy over here, and uh, just getting a good night's sleep. You know, all of this requires pretty good pain-free movement of your shoulder. A lot of the sports uh, that we do and, and, you know, recreational hobbies like cycling and yoga also put quite a bit of stress through our shoulder joints. Now, I, I'm sure some of you are thinking, you know, hey, this guy is talking about shoulder replacements. Why is he uh, showing on these snazzy uh, sports pictures if uh, the patient is going to get a joint replacement? How are they going to do it after that? Well, the truth is, actually, there's a lot of uh, literature out there and evidence that shows that, you know, for sports like swimming, tennis, golf, people do return to uh, the same, if not better, level of activity in about 80 to 92% of the cases. And, uh, you know, for golf, in addition to being pain-free, they start to enjoy better handicaps and improve driving distances as well. So uh, this is a myth to dispel here. So now I'm going to go into uh, shoulder replacements proper and the different kinds we have, right? So how is a total shoulder uh, replacement different from a total hip or a total knee replacement? We already mentioned that you've got the greatest range of movement in the shoulder and your glenoid is less constrained than these other joints. Therefore, there are a lot of shear stresses uh, at that glenoid implant and bone interface. And so there's more susceptible to mechanical loosening and wear. Uh, so usually, previously rather, the success of the total shoulder replacement depended on having an intact and functional rotator cuff and also having adequate glenoid bone stock. As you can see, the size of a glenoid is only about 25 to 30 millimeters. So there's not much uh, real estate to put in an implant there. Uh, and let's say if the patient would have severe wear or dysplasia, again, there wouldn't be enough space to put in a uh, glenoid component. So as I said, in addition to moving the joint, the rotator cuff also has a very important function is that it's a dynamic stabilizer of the joint. You know, through force couples in both the AP and uh, axial planes, it helps to keep the joint centered. So if patient were to have a large rotator cuff tear, what would happen is then, you know, the pull of the delta here goes unopposed and the humeral head migrates upwards and this causes a lot of erosion and wear on the acromion as well as the superior part of the glenoid. Okay, this happens in both native joints as well as prosthetic joints that, you know, lose the stabilizing uh, effect of the rotator cuff. That gives you a painful and uh, poor functioning joint. So now let's go into the history of the reverse shoulder replacements. Okay, in uh, 1893, this French surgeon, uh, Dr. Jules Emile Pian, uh, performed the first shoulder arthroplasty. You can see that the uh, stem was made of platinum and leather, and the uh, rubber ball was coated in paraffin. He had uh, implanted this prosthesis in a patient who had a destroyed shoulder joint from TB. Unfortunately, or obviously, some of you may think uh, the TB recurred 
and uh, two years later, uh, it all had to be removed. So that was the shortest, that was a very short-lived arthroplasty. Fast forward about 50, 60 years, Charles Neer then devised his uh, Mark I prosthesis uh, for shoulder fractures. And uh, it was just a humor hit and humorous component. And it was very successful in treating uh, commuted fractures involving the humor hit. Moving on to the 70s, then he then developed the second, sorry, the second version, which also included a glenoid component. And so this would be the anatomical total shoulder replacements. And these had very good success and result for people with osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, they found that these implants didn't do so well in patients that did not have a functioning rotator cuff. Because as I mentioned, then the implant would be pulled up and cause a lot of erosion and wear. So then a lot of interest went to developing this reverse total shoulder where by reversing the ball and the socket around, they hope to change the dynamics of the joint and uh, get some movement. Now you can see some of these early designs were no better than just putting a hip replacement into the shoulder, you know, and uh, they all failed. They failed catastrophically. Uh, these are very highly constrained implants, and so there's a lot of wear and loosening and stresses at the bone implant interfaces. It was only until about 1985 that another French surgeon Paul Grimont came up with his design for the reverse shoulder. And uh, it is truly his design and his four principles that form the cornerstone of all the successful uh, reverse total shoulder replacements we have today. Without getting too technical, uh, you can see that's your center rotation in a normal shoulder. What he did with his design is for once he actually had it medialized so that the implant would be stable, the bone implant interface, and there would be a longer moment arm for the deltoid to take over the action for the implant. So, in the new reverse total shoulder replacements, the center rotation is moved both medially and inferiorly. And what it does is, it tenses up the deltoid so that it recruits all the fibers, the anterior, posterior fibers, and it takes over the function of the rotator cuff. The implants were so, so inherently stable because they medialized the center rotation. So this new design allowed for increased overhead function, but not normal. Uh, you know, if a normal elevation is about 160, 170 degrees, usually reverses could get reliably restored at least 130 degrees. Uh, there are also no significant gains in external or internal rotation. Uh, but most of these patients were already having a form of pseudo paralysis. So just being able to raise the arms overhead pain free uh, were, were quite a, was quite a big thing for them already. So this slide, uh, you know, I, probably from an old slide deck from about three or four years ago, and this used to be the criteria of what an ideal patient for reverse shoulder arthroplasty would be. I mean, logically, you think. You know, they need to be an older patient with low functional demand so it can uh, last, you know, the lifetime. And uh, you need sufficient glenoid bone stock so that you can put that implant onto the glenoid. And since everything is hanging on your deltoid to, to power the implant, uh, you need a working deltoid muscle and intact axillary nerve as well. But, you know, these days there's a lot of literature showing that these implants are being put in patients younger and younger because, you know, you have patients that have very complex pathologies uh, which with no other kind of solutions that could otherwise uh, reliably help them. And so they're being put in patients, you know, in their 50s as well. But as a general rule, I think 65, 70 onwards is probably a good age to consider it. The problem of insufficient glenoid bone stock, also we've developed techniques to get around that, uh, be it using a uh, bone allograph or metallic wedge augments, and I'll touch more on this later. And then finally, the, the problem of, uh, or rather the requirement of requiring a working deltoid muscle and intact axillary nerve. Uh, now even that's not even a necessity because we have some crazy surgeons doing uh, uh, fancy muscle transfers of the pec major and the trapezius uh, to take over that function as well. So complications, you know, when the implant first came out, the complication rate was very high, between 30 to 60%. And that really scared off a lot of surgeons. 
But the truth is, it was probably because these were first generation implants. The biomechanics of the joint was still not properly um, understood yet, and um, there was a steep learning curve. If you look at the current literature, complication rates currently for a uh, primary reverse shoulder are just around 10%, 13% at most. And if you look at uh, the revision rates uh, due to these complications, uh, look at these uh, two recent studies. Uh, they were a large series and a, a registry data review. Uh, the revision rate was only 2.4 to 5%. So the complications that can occur with the reverse shoulder can be dislocations, prosthetic joint, that happens with any joint, prosthetic joint replacement, uh, implant loosening, which can occur um, uh, over time or just with the in, improper uh, positioning of the components. Deep infections are concerned because there's a lot of dead space around the shoulder joint and it's very near your armpit where we have uh, QT bacterium magnes uh, festering. And uh, you know, we're concerned with intraoperative fractures or periprosthetic fractures that may also occur. This x-ray here, this is actually my grandma. She had a reverse put in very successfully about five years prior to her. She had a fall and a twisting injury and she had this fracture. But fortunately, uh, we didn't need to do any surgery. We just put in a functional cast brace. The fracture healed up and that's her in six weeks able to raise her hand uh, happily again. Scapular notching is a phenomenon uh, that people were worried about initially, but now we realize it's, it's due, it's related to the design of the implant and uh, by changing the design and doing certain um, uh, changes to the technique, this is no longer a problem. And you can see the, initially the, the inferior part of the arm be abutting against the scapula and that would cause wear and loosening of the implant. Finally, uh, axillary nerve and artery injury uh, it's a catastrophic complication, but very rare, less than 1%. Um, and um, usually it's not common. So now we're going to the clinic, clinical indications for reverse shoulder. Now the primary indication was for cuff tear atropathy because there was no good solution for someone with arthritis and without a functioning cuff. You can see this is a typical x-ray where the ball has migrated out of the socket. It's, it's rubbing against the top of the chromium and the top Glenoid. Uh, when reversals were so successful with these patients, suddenly there was an explosion of indications uh, for various scenarios that previously probably didn't have a good uh, solution or now have a better solution for them. And so now we'll go to uh, each of these uh, scenarios in some case examples. Uh, here's a patient of mine, a 73 year old uh, right hand dominant cleaner. So usual past medical problems, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, he presented with a four to six month history of shoulder pain, but he denied any trauma. Just couldn't raise his arm. He was having problems sleeping at night. Tried some physio, painkillers, and wasn't helping. You can see his active range of movement. He only had about 40 degrees of overhead uh, flexion and abduction. Whereas the other side, you get a good 160, 150. X-ray show the typical um, calf tear atrophy findings. So he elected to have a reverse shoulder done. And um, you know, on the day of surgery, he was done in the morning. I came to see him in the evening. He could raise his arm straight up immediately. Uh, I had a fellow uh, with me that day. He was from India and he had never seen a reverse shoulder before. So that was his first experience and he was completely blown away. This was the patient at two weeks and he came just for a wound review. I must say, most patients take about three months or so post-surgery to recover their function. This guy was an exception, but you can see it's, it's very drastic from that pseudo-paralyzed 40-degree angle to come up this high immediately following surgery. As you can see, his rotation, you know, isn't fully restored, but, you know, that comes with uh, the implant as well. There are some limitations still. So similarly with cuff tears and arthritis, we are also using them for patients with massive tears without arthritis, but usually these are for elderly patients. Now, some may say, you know, why not do a smaller procedure like a partial rotator cuff repair or some other soft tissue procedure? Yes, it's uh, cheaper, it's uh, less surgical risk, doesn't burn any bridges, but 
it also has unpredictable outcomes because you're still relying on the patient's uh, native biology to work and, and for healing to occur. And uh, it has longer immobilization periods and rehabilitation periods in general. So, you know, if the, you've got an elderly patient, you want a one-stop solution. Uh, a reverse uh, shoulder replacement allows them earlier mobilization with fairly predictable outcomes. In rheumatoid arthritis patients, it's, it's quite similar to the calf arthropathy patients. You know, you've got, in addition to the joint wear and the tendon, uh, tendinopathies and the thyroid synovitis, uh, you also worry the problems like uh, soft bone and uh, patients may be on uh, biologics and a lot of drugs and that may make them immunocompromised and um, prone to uh, a higher complication rate. So that was the initial concern. As you can see this patient, this MRI shows a lot of, uh, sorry, fatty atrophy of the muscles. Well, now the latest uh, study show that, you know, reverse shoulders for patients with RA showed similar uh, short and midterm results in terms of satisfaction without the higher complication rates when you compare to those for uh, patients with just routine cup tear atrophy or massive routine cup tears. It's just the longevity that uh, we still need other studies um, to, to uh, ascertain. Now, acute proximal reverse fractures in the elderly. This is an area where um, there's a lot of uh, excitement and uh, development in reverse shoulders. It is a patient of mine, uh, a fracture is on the right side. You can see the, the homemade elevation, the external rotation, just slightly less compared to the opposite side. Now, proximal humerus fractures are the third most common fractures amongst the elderly, and their incidence is increasing. Um, even though about 80% of them are actually uh, treated conservatively, you know, amongst the surgical options, if you look, uh, internal fixation is the most commonly performed, and its incidence has remained constant for the last you know, 10, 20 years. However, the use of reverse shoulder uh, arthroplasty has increased by four times, and um, Correspondingly, the hemiatroplasty has been uh, recognized as uh, an inferior procedure for this, and uh, its use has decreased by about half. So the concerns with uh, fracture cases, let's say we were to fix it, do it in the ORF either via a plate or a, a nail, would be there still be a risk of evascular necrosis, screw penetration to the joint, non-union and malunion occurring, and then the patient would still need some revision surgery done. The risk with a hemiatroplasty is that uh, if you, you still require tuberosity union to occur and you don't, if you don't, you get a bad outcome. Uh, since one side is metallic and the other side is um, the cartilage, uh, you're worried about progressive glenoid wear as well. And eventually, or if the cup would ever give way, you get the problem of a square escape and then the implant still needs a revision to reverse. So by doing reverses for these cases, you have none of those worries, none of those concerns. You have easier and faster rehabilitation in the elderly and predictable outcomes. The only problem was, you know, you, you still have the usual risks associated with a reverse shoulder. And uh, when they were first being done in uh, trauma situations, they seem to be occurring at a higher incidence. Similarly, I think this is probably due to the steep learning curve and uh, possibly the surgeons doing it were not uh, really shoulder trained uh, uh, when they were doing approaching these trauma cases. So you can see um, this is a USA registry study. Uh, the national rate of uh, RSA use in trauma has uh, increased quite significantly and it has replaced hemiatroplasties as the most commonly performed atroplastic procedure for proximal fractures above 65. They found that patients with reverses done for fractures were more likely to discharge from earlier compared to heavy patients. This other meta-analysis of seven randomized controlled trials comparing fixation versus hemiatroplasty versus reverses and versus conservative treatment, uh, reverses um, did better than all of them in terms of the constant score and uh, redu reduction in the revision rates. Now your constant score looks at the pain, satisfaction, the ADLs and the range of movement. So you can see it does better than uh, hemis, conservative, and fixation. Here's an interesting case of mine. Uh, 
I had like a discussion. This was a 74 year old right hand dominant lady. She's uh, with the usual comorbidities. She fell from a half meter height while doing housework at home. You can see she's got this nasty four part uh, shoulder fracture dislocation. The humeral head is uh, displaced out of the clenoid. Sorry. That's a clenoid, that's a humeral head displaced and there was in bits. So she, um, she came in one night and then the plan was, okay, let's get her uh, admitted. We uh, give her good analgesia. We get uh, worked up for surgery, do all the necessary scans. She was planned for reverse uh, two days later. So she was fine on day zero, she was fine on day one. Uh, but then suddenly on uh, day two, she woke up and she had uh, complete paralysis of the right arm. You know, nothing was working, axillary nerve, radial nerve, median nerve. She had a very dense palsy. You know, we, uh, we did repeated all the imaging again. We got an MRI scan as well to see uh, if there's any injury to the plexus. All you could see is just hematoma everywhere. And we figured since her nerves were working fine the first two days, probably just a palsy. But uh, then comes, so what do we do now? You know, do we do a reverse? If, if it's all going to be hanging on the deltoid, which is not working now because of the palsy, is it going to dislocate? Is it going to be functional? If we do a fixation, uh, you know, it's, we know it's an inferior procedure and uh, the shoulder will still be out since all the muscles are not working. And uh, some were concerned that, you know, at her age, even if it was a palsy, you know, the nerve may not recover. Maybe she'd be considering a fusion instead. Um, well, I ended up doing a reverse shoulder for her. And then we um, said our prayers and, and waited, uh, waited uh, with bated breath. So, you know, one month, nothing happened. Second month, nothing happened. We did uh, all the nerve conduction studies, uh, confirmed that the axillary, radial, median nerves were having a decreased motor potential uh, amplitudes. It's probably a uh, upper plexus, uh, upper trunk uh, palsy going on. Third month, still nothing happened. This is where I've been sweat. But in the fourth month, she walked in and we um, were very pleasantly surprised. Uh, she had, you know, as good an outcome as uh, we could have hoped for, even without a uh, palsy, and so she was very happy. Again, you can see even her rotation is pretty decent. So the, the reverse shoulder is also very useful for revising uh, previously failed uh, either total arthroplasties or hemiarthroplasties. Uh, this is an example of a lady, she's 70 years old, she has a past history of uh, various orthopedic procedures, of note, she had a, also had a four-part uh, shoulder fracture done three years before at a different institute. And she had a hemiatroplasty. Uh, she told me that the shoulder is never quite the same after that, but um, especially over the last one year, she was having severe pain and she couldn't raise her arm anymore. Uh, she was taking medicines and applying uh, plasters on a daily basis. And she couldn't sleep. And she had truly exhausted physio. In fact, she'd seen another doctor who said, you know, she, she just had given up and she just wanted something to do and to be pain-free and good to raise her arm again. So her other doctor referred her to me. And this is what we found. You know, the implant had migrated out because the cuff had probably given way. You can see her, her movement was pretty poor. Port flexion and abduction about 40 and, and close to zero rotation. So what I had to do is remove her stem and put in a... Uh, reverse shoulder replacement. These days we have more modern implants. They're platform systems. You don't need to remove the stems anymore. You can still just retain the original stem and just remove the head portion of it and then put in the rest. So it's pretty neat. Uh, but for her, we still had to do the old way, but uh, it worked for her. And immediately after the procedure, she had pain relief and she was smiling wider than the smiley face here. And uh, you can see, even though her function is better than before, Still not as good as um, the function you'd expect following a primary reverse shoulder, and, and the evidence also supports that time and time again. Uh, reverse shoulder is done for in revision scenarios, don't do as well as reverses done in a primary scenario. So, even in uh, fracture, scenario, uh, fracture cases, uh, fracture surgeries that uh, go wrong, uh, the reverses can be handy. This patient here, yeah, she's a uh, 70 years old, uh, she had a history of left breast cancer, the mastectomy and radiotherapy done to the area. Uh, 
she had a two-part surgical neck fracture which was treated conservatively by someone else and um, unfortunately it didn't heal. So then the surgeon decided to do a, a minimally invasive uh, fixation plating with bone grafting. Sorry. So you can see there's a bone graft and a plate put in, but even after eight months, it never healed and it was loose. So she had a lot of pain in her shoulder, she couldn't raise it, and then he referred it to me for, to revise. So when I saw her, you can see the CT scan shows no bone going across the, the two parts, and uh, she similarly has uh, pseudochorialysis, but she has uh, no overhead function in the shoulder. So, you know, post reverse, at six months, you can say she's got no pain, she's got no issues, happy with her function, life is back to normal. She can drive, she can do her cooking, she can independently manage all her activities of daily living, and she wasn't aware of her left shoulder condition at times. Uh, similarly, you know, probably her range of movement is only about 100 degrees, not, not like full overhead, but uh, such a far cry from the original place that she was so happy that she didn't even want to go physio and uh, get better range of movement than that. <clears throat> Primary osteoarthritis. So usually for people who just have arthritis, by the functioning cuff, uh, a normal shoulder replacement suffice. But there have been uh, scenarios where uh, maybe for these patients, a reverse might do, uh, might be better. Uh, examples would be patients who have so much glenoid wear or glenoid dysplasia that they can't put in the components safely. So, uh, some controversial indications uh, with OA patients might be those that have uh, cuff tests that you can't repair or people with cuff atrophy. This patient of mine, uh, she was in the mid-70s, she was a canteen help, uh, helper who was very active, liked to go on holidays on her own. She had very severe osteoarthritis, the pain was getting at her uh, daily and she told, she'd say the pain can die, uh, you know, she was, she was very bothered by it. And we were managing her conservatively for about six to nine months before she went and did an anatomical shoulder replacement for her. And uh, she did very well following that. See that, and you can see that's her left side still not raised because um, we hadn't done the left yet. So, about uh, two or three years later, it was time to do the left side. I was thinking, shall we do the anatomical again, or should we just do a reverse? Pros and cons being if, um, let's say, if a cup were to give way, then she would need a revision to reverse uh, subsequently in the future. But if we just did it one time, you know, this is the only operation she'd need. She was already in the late 70s, so it was pretty safe. So we did a reverse for her, so she's got an anatomical on one side, a reverse on the other side, but uh, she's still happy and a uh, pretty good range of movement. I mean, as you can see, the side with the anatomical has better internal rotation than the uh, side with the reverse, uh, but this was early, this was about two, two to three months post-surgery, so um, sometimes there are more gains are possible even up to a year, a year and a half post-surgery. In tumor scenarios, you know, usually when you're doing limb preservation, you remove that whole chunk of bone. You put in a big uh, metallic prosthesis. You know, yes, you have limb preservation, you've got a functioning elbow and hand, but without all the soft tissues around the shoulder, um, you know, you don't really have a functional shoulder joint. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if the tumor excision allows us to retain the glenoid component, retain the glenoid bone, retain the axillary nerve and the deltoid, uh, then we're able to do reverse shoulders such as this case. This was an 80 year old lady. Um, she had a metastatic um, thyroid cancer and uh, she had a lot of pain and uh, this is how she was presented. Uh, we were able to do a reverse for her that really helped with the pain and her function. She could still use arm fairly uh, immediately after surgery. Okay, this is my final case example. You know, then you've got a whole bunch of scenarios where, you know, patients may have a deficient rotator cuff, they may have gross instability, they may have uh, large bony defects in the humeral heads, they may have genohumeral arthritis or a combination of these. So, so in these complex cases where they have a combination of pathologies, uh, this reverse can be helpful. This case of mine, she was a uh, lady in her late 60s. Uh, she was a factory worker. She had a male united uh, two part uh, shoulder fracture dislocation of the greater toporosity that was treated conservatively. 
actually following the initial injury, she was well for about seven months and she was still alive as per usual and uh, working in the factory. But some, for some reason, after seven months, she started having gross instability. The shoulder would pop out the front, it pop out the back. You know, we'd have to reduce it under GA and in between the reduction and getting back to the ward or getting an x-ray done, it would just pop out again. So you can see on the x-ray, you know, there's a uh, the shoulders out, there's a uh, bony defect on the CT scan. You can see bone missing on the back, on the front. Intraoperatively, uh, you can see a huge depression where the, the humeral head got impacted against the glenoid. The rotator cuff was all missing. I think the subset was still attached. And uh, looking from the top, you can see bone missing on the back, in the middle, and even on the front here. This patient actually also had a, a past medical history of epilepsy, even though you know she hadn't had a she was well controlled medications. She hadn't had a, an episode in more than five years, and it really wasn't the cause for her instability. Unless uh, I did take the precautions, I used a constrained kind of component, uh, just in case she was ever to have any uh, uh, epileptic attacks in future, which touch so far she hasn't, and uh, even using constrained. Uh, uh, implants she still had very good range of movement. This was her three months, uh, at two years, uh, and last saw then it was, it was still doing to a bridge move is still just as good. Okay, so now we come to where are we now? All right. So there are a lot of studies to show that you know the reverse shoulder gives you very reliable pain relief and uh, reliable restoration of your overhead elevation and patient satisfaction. If you look at all these studies, all of them are comparing the pre and post operative constant scores. And you can see the constant scores usually all go up by two to three times. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is constant scores reflection of their, their range of movement, their pain, their satisfaction, their ability to do the ADLs. See all these multiple studies here as well how the mean uh, overhead elevation is about 130 degrees, so we can reliably restore that much. Looking at the prosthesis survivorship, a lot of studies show that around 10 years, uh, the survival is about 93% or so, you know, dropping to about 87 at 20 years, which is still very good. Some of the things we, uh, the, the future, or rather some of the newer developments we have is uh, planning software and uh, patient-specific instruments that help us uh, to uh, put in our implants more precisely. Previously, you'd just be looking at a round glenoid and you're try, kind of guesstimating how you should angle your arm to do the drilling. But now with the computer software, you can uh, see the native bone. You know, you can plan where you want your components to be and the trajectories for the screws. And then you can even uh, print out or make jigs for you to just apply it directly onto the patient's bone. And that'll help you drill straight down into the vault each time. See, here's an example of Patient, uh, surgeon trying to just drill through the glenoid you've seen when you're missing the vault. Whereas with the software, you're able to go and stick within the vault. Uh, another de interesting development is uh, previously patients who had significant uh, glenoid wear, you wouldn't be able to put any implants onto those. Um, you know, we, we tried uh, bone allograph uh, or autograph uh, methods, but uh, there, there are additional risks associated with that. So now when we're using metallic uh, augments, it's very exciting because you can get over that hurdle and uh, you can just replace the missing part with uh, metal and, and just continue the operation uh, uh, just how you would normally. So this is uh, another exciting uh, uh, advance we've got now. So just sharing, you know, um, this is a, a audit we did in my uh, previous institution. Uh, local experience just in the last four years alone, we're seeing that the number of shoulder joint replacements has increased like uh, four times, and the length of hospital stays you know decreased from like uh, five days to like one or two days. And previously they'd stay, they'd be a drain, be walk, watching the wounds. Uh, now you know we have no drains, and they can go back uh, just after a day or two. In fact, even uh, even earlier this year when because um, of COVID. We had to cut down on electives and said, okay, no inpatient surgeries could go on, but uh, you know, those 23 hour day surgery kind of cases could go on. So people are still getting their shoulder joints done then. 
because uh, you know they could just stay at night and go back the next day without any increased uh, complications or, or problems. Uh, yeah, so we also know that the average age of the patients are getting younger. It used to be 80s and late 70s. Now it's coming down to about 70. And uh, the blood loss has also decreased quite considerably. And uh, how is this possible? Well, it boils down to, you know, we better understanding the biomechanics, new newer surgical techniques, and newer implants. So how do these implants allow for less invasive surgery? I mentioned now you've got platform systems, whereas previously if you had a stem and you needed to remove it and do something else, uh, you know, you have to take off the whole thing and that could involve fractures and a lot of morbidity. Whereas now you can just retain that same stem and just take off the modular component and put in the next modular component. Less blood loss, well, it boils down to uh, know, knowing that, okay, with research now, we know we shouldn't be putting in drains. We can be using adjuncts like uh, transdynamic acid would increase the bleeding. Uh, even the size of the stems, you know, when they first started, no one knew better. Uh, the stem is the same size as a hip stem, 15 centimeters long. Then you realize it doesn't need to be so long in the shoulder, but shorter and shorter from 15 to 11 to 8 to 5. And even now, you even got stemless replacements. Can you imagine trying to remove and revise this? And trying to move and revise this is so much easier doing that. And without having to violate the canal with such large implants and, and using cementing, uh, now with cementless, uh, that also contributed to, to less blood loss. So overall, all this allows the patient to recover faster, have a shorter hospitalization stay, and with a better understanding of the uh, materials and tribology, you get longer implant survival and overall better functional outcomes. So you can see the implants are getting better. Uh, the surgeons are getting better because they are, they're going to, you know, uh, fellowships and high volume centers and learn how to do it. So what's left? Okay, the last thing we need is education. Uh, we need to educate the patients that, look, you know, you've got a problem, but you don't have to suffer. There are solutions uh, with good track records. So patient education is very important. And uh, you can do that either via, you know, high impact uh, journals uh, for them to for them to be aware, or you know, health magazines and uh, you know, other patients can share their stories how they suffered before and now they're enjoying their golf again and, and life in general. So patient education is very important. Uh, and other than that, uh, educating the doctors as well. So the the non orthopedic specialists, the primary care physicians, because you guys uh, see these patients and you can actually advise them properly. So it's talks, CME talks like this, and uh, you know, G, you know, GP and uh, primary care physician talks like this, where um, you all can learn about the latest advances and, and how you can help your patients and advise them accordingly. Also for shoulder surgeons, you know, we, we, we attend courses and uh, you, you know, you learn uh, how you can better your outcomes and uh, some tricks and tricks when doing the, the procedure. Okay, so to summarize, the river shoulder is here to stay and it can potentially help a lot of patients with various pathologies. Uh, you look at this, these are uh, like seven different national registries and you look at how the incidence of uh, shoulder arthroplasty is just shooting up. This graph here uh, is the uh, number of river shoulders being done in Australia. So you can see in, uh, in a five year period, we went from 1,000 to 4,000, which is four times just like what we're seeing here as well. And even amongst arthroplasty procedures, you can see the reverse uh, shoulder is forming a bigger and bigger uh, portion of the pine um, of the procedures done. Secondly, you know, as our understanding of the reverse shoulder biomechanics continues to evolve, you know, so together with that, we'll also have advances in reverse shoulder design, we'll have better surgical techniques, and we'll have superior clinical outcomes. I really like this picture here because this is what I'm aiming for every time I, I, I do a case. You know, patients are happy that they, you know, they've got no pain and they're independent again. But you know, I tell them I'm never really happy till they can give me a high five again. I can take that picture of them with their hands up like they're being held up. So this is what we're always striving for. And, and finally, I guess just regarding shoulder atrophy in the elderly, I think it's important to note that initial conservative management is always acceptable. And you know, the decision for surgery is then finally based on the patient's uh, physiological age, you know, the activity level, the demands and expectations. You know, I had patients with um, like 79 years old, but they were still going to the gym, still doing pull-ups and push-ups and 
killing the weight machines and I told them, look, I, I don't think uh, this is for you yet. I think you're ready to lower your expectations and demands. Uh, perhaps then uh, we can find a solution for you. And uh, also doing a surgery is not enough. There is a physio protocol that they have to go through after that. So they, they need to be able to follow those protocols. That said, uh, you know, I've had some patients, uh, you know, with mild Parkinson's and you know, who, you know, for whatever problem, they were not a pain and following surgery, they could uh, have relief from pain and overhead function. So um, sometimes uh, the, it's, it's, it's fairly natural, the, the recovery process. As long as they start using the arm for their daily activities, uh, as how they normally would have, uh, you do kind of recover the function. And uh, finally, the take home, I guess, for you guys is, you know, now with the newer techniques and the implant designs, you know, the complication rates are lower, the longevity is improved, and you're getting better recovery and better functional outcomes. Okay? So then, uh, thank all of you for listening, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. I look to the questions. If uh, you're not going to ask here, I've got my uh, number and my email here. You can always ask me as well. If there are no questions, then uh, thank you, Ruben, again for your, uh, taking your precious time to, to speak to us. Uh, for everybody, before you leave the session, can you help us with the polls or leave us your feedback on the session? So thank you, everyone, again for your time and uh, have a good uh, weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.